Hey, welcome to Transform Your Workplace. It's Brandon Laws, your host. Today's episode is brought to you by Zenium HR. This is your last chance. I've talked about it the last couple of times on the show. You can sign up for the What People Want From Work survey. This is an annual survey that Zenium puts on. This is the sixth year we've been doing it. And this is a free survey for you to participate in where you can ask your employees what they want out of work. Company leadership, compensation, benefits, perks, development opportunities, diversity, equity, inclusion practices, and so much more. We'll give you the survey and the instructions. You send it out to your employees. We do the rest. Learn more and sign up. The link is in the show notes. Okay, I'm excited for this episode. I had a conversation with Adrian Gostick. He's the co-author of the brand new book, Anxiety at Work. Adrian and his co-author, Chester Elton, have written tons of books. And I had Adrian on probably at the beginning of the pandemic. And we talked about his recent book at the time. And since then, they've wrote the book, Anxiety at Work. And the chances are you it's touched your life in some way, whether it's a colleague, yourself, a family member, probably no stranger to it. Anxiety touches our lives in a lot of different ways. But you know, are we talking about it? I think that's the question. I think it's time to break the stigma around anxiety, mental health, all of that. And so this episode today with Adrian, we are unpacking how we can tackle some of these issues that are burdening our employees and how do we remove the weight of anxiety in the workplace so you're gonna love this episode i'd love to hear what you think about it reach out to me on linkedin instagram twitter any of those places and hope you enjoy the show with adrian gostick Adrian, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Hey, it's my pleasure, Brandon. I'm excited to talk about your new book, Anxiety at Work, Eight Strategies to Help Teams Build Resilience, Handle Uncertainty, and Get Stuff Done. So what's interesting is this came out right around, I mean, we're still in the pandemic, but you know, I'm curious where anxiety was heading pre-pandemic and then even during COVID and all this, where our anxiety levels. It's a great place to start because we began this book back in 2018 when we were seeing about one in five employees having a full-blown anxiety disorder they were living with. And yet we didn't talk about this almost at all back then. Mm. I mean, that was three years ago. Remember way back then, you know, the reason we started talking about it, we just said, look, this is going to be a wave that we need to start addressing. Managers just don't have any tools to deal with this. But imagine that one in five of your employees came into work with a broken arm every day. But we don't talk about broken arms, you know, because yeah, it gets really touchy-feely. And we don't, yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. Well, right. here's an injury to the most important organ in our body, our brains, and we weren't talking about it. Well, now, then, as you say, the pandemic hits. And all of a sudden, we saw anxiety levels go from around 18% to within the U.S., the Census Department is showing about 30% of all working adults having a full-blown anxiety disorder by the time we're in the middle of the 2020, and 42% of people in their 20s. That is pretty remarkable. And yet, still, this is just starting to become a discussion many organizations are having. So that, that's really our mission here is to remove the stigma and get conversations going and, and maybe give managers some tools to help. Yeah, it's interesting you say like just talking about it in general. I mean, years ago, we weren't talking about this at all. And now it's it's taking a even global stage. It was it yesterday, I think Simone Biles yeah. of the United States uh, Olympian, like, I think just withdrew because of mental health. And I think it's nice that people are now starting to talk about it. Yeah. You know, we have Naomi Osaka, we have Simone Biles, you know, these, you, you kind of think sometimes there's this myth that, well, you know, just people, they just can't hack it. They're not as talented. They're not as confident. Well, you know, you, you look at Naomi number two in the world, you look right. at Simone number one in the world. These are extremely competent, very confident people, but anxiety is getting to them. And is this impacting our workplace? You think this just 
two Olympians? That's all that's <laughs> affecting? <laughs> so what we need to do is start having these discussions. What was interesting with Naomi Osaka was at first it was reacted, you know, well, she's not, she's going to be banned from this, that, and the other. And then she goes, okay. And, and then everybody backs it off when they realize, well, this is serious. Serious, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's such a shame that we are just starting to understand an issue that has been around for years. Yeah, and so what I hear often is that we're using words like worry, stress, and anxiety like really interchangeably. How do you define anxiety and how they may differ from those other words that I mentioned? That's a great question because we do tend to do that. They are very different terms. You know, worry is we're focused on a specific event. Gee, I'm going to fly tomorrow. Am I going to catch COVID? Stress is when we start worrying and worrying and it starts building up. You know, maybe my job is extremely worrisome and it builds into stress that starts affecting my body. You know, we all know the signs of stress, right? The impact is all very different. Differently, but it starts becoming biological. Anxiety is different. Anxiety, even when we remove a stressor, is still there. It can interfere with our work, our life. It is that intense and excessive and persistent worry and fear about unfamiliar situations or even everyday situations. You know, somebody, as we were doing our interviews for Anxiety at Work, she said, you know, anxiety, she says, makes me feel the, the problems that I face are insurmountable and mm. my ability to cope is insignificant. You know, we just feel like, like ants, you know? So it's safe to say like anxiety is this perpetual and it's like the worry, stress, all those things built onto each other. And then it's like this just constant feeling and that's the anxiety yeah and 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 now as people who have anxiety can say well look it can come and go it you know as you see with simone biles it's you know it just hit her at this point yeah all the pressure all the stress and that other times other olympics perhaps it's not as pervasive and so there's several ways of thinking about anxiety the first is a disorder you're born with the second is you're, it's created within you from ptsd or 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 other trauma that's happened to you over your life Another is that it's transient, that it may hit you like we're seeing with COVID, where people who didn't really have much of an issue before, after 15, 16 months of going through this, it's starting to hit them and it's become very real within them and it's full-blown anxiety. Yeah. There's a line in your book that I'm like, I couldn't ignore. It says, you have anxiety about your anxiety. (laughs) So it's like this thought of like, I've got anxiety that I'm going to have my anxiety or something. And I just found that fascinating because it seems like a vicious circle. Like what have you found that to be true? Oh, absolutely. And that's one where, yeah, if if you or your employees are suffering or do suffer from anxiety, a lot of times, yeah, they can definitely get themselves into this situation where, you know, we just kind of start thinking, I'm anxious about becoming anxious. And, and it just becomes this self-perpetuating uh, <laughs> process that we have to break. And there are ways to break that. It's hard, but that's why, you know, sports psychology, you and yeah, we're kind of focusing on sports for a moment just because the Olympics are going on. But, but right now, sports psychology has become so important because people do have to break the cycle. And we have to do it on our own work as well. That if we do fall into that category where we start anticipating our anxiety, you know, there's a couple of things we have to focus on. First is you can control what you can control. It sounds really simple, but you really have to focus on, look, I can't control all the other things outside of it. What did Naomi Osaka say? She goes, I can't go to the press conference. Well, they said, well, then you can't mm-hmm. be in our tournament. And she says, I can control not doing that part. And she says, I could focus on the game. But not that. It was really fascinating. She was trying to control what she could control. How many times, though, do managers push against that and say, no, no, but you've got to do this. Right. And the other part of dealing with anxiety about anxiety is having a support network that really is supportive. You know, because sometimes I'll, I'll talk to somebody, they'll go, every day I talk to my mom and she just doesn't get this. She's not supportive at all. I said, stop talking to your mom about this. I mean, <laughs> doesn't, mean, doesn't mean don't talk to your mom. Just don't talk to her about your anxiety. She'll never get it. Find somebody who is supportive or or a group of people and talk with them about your health. You know, they say soldiers coming back from war 
you know, who's the best people to talk to? It's not therapists. It's not their commanding officer. It's fellow soldiers, Mm -hmm. those who have been through the trenches. When it comes to anxiety, is it a problem with a certain group of people, age group, generational group, or is it really just an inherent problem in our society? Yeah, that's, that's a great question because, because there's, you know, multiple answers to that. One is that we've had anxiety for years. Those of us in the older generations, we just never talked about it. You know, it was rub some dirt on it, get back out there, hmm. you know. Can't just slap a smile on your face. We had all these ways of dealing with it. So it was just inappropriate to talk about and, and people hit it. You know, we call it the duck syndrome where, you know, you see a duck gliding on the pond. They look so calm, but under the water, they're pedaling like mad. Well, <laughs> yeah. we were ducks. Now, what we are seeing though is this younger generation. We people think of people in their twenties. There's a couple of things. First off, they talk about this. They don't see the stigma around it. They go, look, it's, it's one of the organs of my body. I talk about my mental health. In fact, you know, if you're in your early 20s, there's a very good chance you talk about your mental health every single day, almost in every conversation you have. It was fascinating, the research and also the interviews we did with, with so many millennials. Now, the second part of the generational question is there actually is more anxiety as well. It's a generation, the younger generation coming into the workplace. They've grown up with electronic devices, which are unfortunately anxiety inducing. You know, many of them, have, you know, keep them on all night. And so they're never disconnected. And our minds have to disconnect now and then from electronics. They're also incredibly anxiety inducing with social media. We're constantly comparing ourselves to us. But it's also a generation where we as parents, we were hover parents. We worried. You know, my mom and dad didn't know where I was from 7 a.m. till 10 at night. (laughs) But I knew where my son was every 15 minutes, you know, if he didn't report in. And so we just created this. I mean, they went through active shooter drills in school. They So so that now they go into a movie theater and they're looking for the exits. It's incredibly anxiety-inducing as well as all the doom scrolling we do. So that, you know, you think of the elections we went through here in the U.S., you know, half the people in the early 20s thought the world was ending. And, you know, we in the older generations went, no, this happens lots, to, you know, yeah, every exactly. three years. it's wacky. We'll get through it. So we've created a lot of angst and anxiety that we have to accept this is something we have to work through. You know, the point for all of us as leaders is we don't have to make our workplaces one of these anxiety inducing places. Exactly. You know, there was a a really good point you made in the book about like when a manager is asking for time with an employee and and they're so vague about it and how that is anxiety inducing. Like, how do you suggest people like managers go about like asking for time? Like, can we meet tomorrow and then like to just totally leave them hanging about it. <laughs> yeah, ta ta ta. Right? <laughs> it's, yeah, and this was told with my son, Anthony, who's 25. He's a brilliant young man. He's a genetics researcher and he helped write the book. And so he's, wow. he, he gave us a lot of really interesting insights. So he's worked for many years in labs and, you know, there's managers and he's born with anxiety. So he's lived with this all his life. And he says, look, some managers get me, some just never will. He says, the ones that do, they'll tell me, hey, you know, Anthony, I want to meet with you tomorrow about, you know, the report you're working on. Da, 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 da. I want to give you some parameters and da, da, da. very specific. It, it really helps me. He says, the ones that don't get me say, hey, Anthony, uh, come in early tomorrow. I want to talk with you. I'm says, getting fired. <laughs> yeah, I don't sleep that night. Yeah. Because, you know, we're worrying about our jobs. We're worrying about our futures. Just some very simple advice. I love that you picked up on that because there are some things we do as leaders that we just don't even realize sometimes. Mm-hmm. The anxiety we do create. I caught that because I've done it so many times with my employees. Like, hey, do you have five minutes? Like, that's just five minutes about this design project that we just worked on together. You know, so I need to be more specific. So I, I like I like that a lot. When it comes to like anxiety at work, what's one of the biggest fears that these, especially the younger group of people, have when it comes to the workplace? You know, really, one of the biggest fears for people, for especially younger people, is will I keep my job. Every organization, when I go in and do a speech in an organization, I would say every single time I get told by the CEO, the senior leaders, now we want our people to take risks and go out there. And when you talk individually, 
with younger people, they go, yeah, I'm not doing that. You know, because my job is at stake. You know, I was promised all these cool things when I got out of school. There would be, you know, great jobs and stuff. There's not. And I want to keep the job I have. So now I'll keep my opinions to myself. So we don't get robust debate. We don't get, you know, the the ideation that we need. So really, you know, there's this fear of keeping my job. Another fear is uncertainty. I don't really know what's happening right now. Where's our organization going? And and am I adding value in the progress of our organization? You know, so I do executive coaching. And sometimes, you know, I'll talk to leaders and they'll say, no, 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 you know, it's okay because we talked about our strategy back in January. And so everybody knows it now. I said, okay, yeah, great. What have you done this week? Your strategy, your mission, your vision. And how people are living up to it, what competitive threats are they facing, how we're going to respond. This is something you have to do continually because there's so much uncertainty out there right now. Of course, we'll never eliminate it all. But what we can do is make me feel like, hey, we're going into the dark together. You know, Brandon, don't feel like you're alone on this. We're going to figure things out as we go. We don't have all the answers, but I value you and your work. And together, you know, here's what we're facing. And let's talk about these. Let's get you involved in the debate of how we improve. You wrote that leaders should loosen their grip in tough times. What did you mean by that? You know, this is an interesting analogy. We we are actually interviewing one of the uh, Thunderbird pilots. You know, this is the Air Force's uh, demonstration squadron. And Nicole Malachowski, she said, look, she says, you know, I, she says, I had a decade in the, in the pilot seat as a fighter pilot. And she says, when you hit rough air, you clamp down on your, on your stick, you take control. She says, that's not the case when you're flying in formation though, in a team. She says, so the first day with the the demonstration squadron, we hit turbulence, which you always do. And she says, I clamp down. And when we land, one of the fellow pilots says, Nicole, that's incredibly dangerous. She says, but it's our bad. We should have told you when you hit turbulence, you go to two fingers on the stick. When you're in formation, you go to loosen your grip. And she said it was counterintuitive. I wanted to take control. And and don't we all, when times are tough, we want to take control. I want to micromanage everything. But she says, no, no, you have to loosen your grip. You have to trust your team. Now, you still stay in constant contact. They're, you know, the, the Thunderbirds, they're constantly talking with each other. They're making course corrections. I thought it was all computerized. She says, no, no, there's no computers. It's all done verbally. And so I thought that was just fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah. So that's the idea, right? We tend to micromanage. We tend to tighten up our grip, which is incredibly anxiety inducing when we're stressed, when we, you know, have big deadlines to hit. We got to loosen our grip now and then and trust our people and give them their reign. I think one of the biggest issues that employers are facing is they're feeling this sense of just overwhelmed, like there's too much to do. And you mentioned that there's two types of people when it comes to managing tasks, taskers and optimizers. Will you explain the difference between the two and also which is more effective for not like completely burning out? Yeah, so this was something we we found with the Navy SEALs. You know, you're trying to become a a Navy SEAL. And as you know, probably I think it's 80, 90% of the, I mean, these are incredibly fit men and women going in to become Navy SEALs. And most of them wash out because it is incredibly mentally taxing as well as physically. Researchers have studied this. They found two archetypes, people who try to, to finish the Navy SEAL, especially Hell Week, which is, you know, five days, four hours total sleep. And the first group are taskers, those who just methodically go from one task to the other, rest when they can, you know, the other plotters, if you will. The other group are the optimizers, the, the folks who look at the entire week and say, okay, here's all the things we've got to accomplish. When they finish one task, they're brainstorming about how I'm going to get through the next. And to me, it was a little counterintuitive mm. because the group that makes it through vastly more than the other are the taskers, those who just work on one thing at a time. You know, it's like the old saying, how do you eat eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. So we also interviewed marathon runners, triathletes, and they say, yeah, look, I don't think about the race. I think about that next telephone pole in front of me. I think about that rise and trying to make a little bit of a move on the person in front of me. I think about the next thing on the horizon, not the entire race. So when you think about anxiety and overload, you know, that's what we teach our people. That's how we do it ourselves is you focus on to one task at a time. And as leaders, you help prioritize. 
He said, look, Monday morning, Brandon, let's, let's meet for a minute. What have you got going this week? Okay, so we got 10 things on the, on the agenda. Here's what I think are the priorities. I want you to focus on one, two, three. If seven, eight, and nine fall off, that's okay. We'll, we'll readdress them next week. Here's what I think is most important to the team. I mean, it sounds so simple, right? Mm -hmm. But so few managers do the, such simple things that can really reduce anxiety in, during times of overload. I think in business, like, I mean, productivity and results are everything. And we're in a, in a lot of ways, I think leaders are asking so much of their employees. They're constantly demanding more, especially for teams who are finishing projects early. They're doing it perfectly. And then they for the next project, they're asking more and more and more. What do you say to those managers who are continually like driving their teams crazy by demanding more? You know, and a lot of times when we get asked to come in, so, you know, to give a lecture or do a workshop on resilience or mental health, oftentimes we find, you know, employees meet this with a lot of skepticism because they go, yeah, no, no, we've been this before. It's all, we have to sleep better. We have to better prioritize. We have to organize ourselves. We do, we're supposed to do meditation. What about them, you know, which are the bosses, right? What about the way that the work is being assigned to us? You know, well, what we find is that we really do have to reevaluate. If we keep demanding more and more, faster and faster, we're going to be alone pretty quickly. Yeah. You, you're probably thinking about, you know, an example in the book with one of the, actually was a coaching client of mine and he, he led an SAP team. He says, we just did an upgrade. I wanted to push my team, get the yes. best <laughs> results we've ever had. And, and we did it. We did, you know, amazing. We all worked, you know, 70, 80 hour weeks. And we were so proud of ourselves. And what happened? My boss came and said, that was great work, Quan. Next, next upgrade, I wanted it in 10% faster time. He says, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. He says, I regret now pushing my team. So we're creating these environments. Instead of having honest dialogues and having a push-pull about what is realistic so we're not burning our people out, and that we really can create an environment where people are able to do their best work but we'll still be able to maintain productivity and performance over time. I think a huge issue for employees, and I think you alluded to this a little bit earlier, is when they're newer in their careers, they just don't know where their career is going and that gives them anxiety. How could leaders help reduce employees' anxiety about where they're heading in their career? We, uh, we did spend a chapter uh, on this idea of really helping people chart their path. And because this really is, as you mentioned, it really is a huge issue because a lot of times we'll be brought in to, to help attract and retain employees. And one of the things we talk about is, you know, the way you attract people is let them know you're going to care about their career. You're actually going to have development plans in place because most of the time when employees join an organization, they're feeling like, Okay, now I'm on my own. You know, I'm supposed to get a review in six months. Maybe it's a year. Mm -hmm. What we find, in fact, in retail organizations that were, or like service organizations, they're actually having career conversations every week because their turnover is so high and they're finding this is, is one of the most powerful ways to cut turnover. In many office settings, they, they're starting to do these monthly where they're having what they call career or aspirational conversations. And it's not about your projects. It's not about interpersonal things. It's just about your career. So you meet with your manager who takes the role of a coach and says, okay, Brandon, where do you want to go? Okay, are we helping you get there? Are you getting the training you need, the cross-functional opportunities? You take simple steps like this, which is actually something a manager can do. I, I might not be able to give you huge promotions, but I can at least set the realistic expectations of what it'll take for you to move to the next step or to, to get additional, you know, training or ideas. You know, one, one of our clients is uh, Kraft Heinz and, you know, the, our, the head of HR, she says, we don't think about careers as this ladder anymore. We think about it as a rock climbing wall. You know, if you're on a climbing wall, she says, the only thing you can't do is just stay there. You have to move. Pretty quickly, you realize I'm going to drop if I, if I just stay there. So I keep moving. I move sideways. I move up. Sometimes you come down to go back up. She says, you're always moving on a rock wall. And I just thought it was a great analogy. That's our careers. We have to help people know we're going to keep moving here. We're going to keep you growing and developing. And that brings a lot of anxiety down. 
earlier you mentioned with especially the younger generation that with social media they're constantly comparing themselves to other people and and I think even with the you know the Xers the Boomers they they were keeping up with the Joneses and we're constantly striving for perfection comparing ourselves to other people and I suspect that brings on anxiety in all of us what are your thoughts just about the whole perfectionistic culture and comparing ourselves to other people and what is it doing to us yeah, that's, that's a good question. Back when I was in MBA school, you know, we were told, actually, if somebody asked you that interview question, what's your biggest weakness? We were supposed to say, <laughs> I'm a perfectionist. You know, it's a terrible answer because we find perfectionists actually get less done than people who are just diligent strivers. Perfectionists are so afraid of making a mistake that they have a really hard time getting started. Often they think, well, since I'm not going to get it perfect, I won't even try as hard. They, they put a, unrealistic expectations on themselves and others versus, you know, somebody who realizes, look, I'm, I'm not going to be perfect. I'm just going to do the best I can. So one of the things we find, and we give a lot of examples that we have a chapter on perfectionism. And the first thing you got to do is simply clarify what good enough looks like. So my son, Anthony, who's, who's the scientist, he says, I'm assigned to extract DNA from these 10-year-old samples. And he says, so I'm working on this for day after day, and I'm getting seven or eight out of 10, and I'm feeling more and more stressed. I'm not perfect at this. And he says, it wasn't until the end of the week, my boss comes in and goes, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, seven or eight out of 10 uh, for decade-old samples, that's, that's actually uh, about what we'd expect. And he, he just told me, he says, why didn't he tell me that at the beginning? I was so stressed. We just have to help people understand this is what good enough looks like. You got to create a culture where we celebrate failures too. Yes. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm doing coaching when I did a 360 with, with a CEO and I talked to his people and I love that they said, we can make any mistake once which I thought was really interesting. It wasn't a negative. They said, look, no, he doesn't want us to make the same mistakes, be sloppy, but we're allowed to take chances. But he says he treats these failures as learning opportunities, which I thought was terrific. The pandemic isolated so many of us. And I, I honestly believe that the lack of connection probably made us all a little bit more anxious, just the lack of connection. What can leaders do to bring people together, build the social bonds again? Well, it just depends too whether you're now back in the office. So many organizations are not. Of course, so many had to stay back. If you're running a restaurant, if you're running a healthcare organization, et cetera, you know, you didn't have a pandemic. You, well, you did, but it was Different. still, it really depends where you're coming from. So if you're running a remote team, which many are still, now there's this anxiety of, you know, coming back together. You know, I'm going to be sitting next to Susie. Is she vaccinated? Is she not? Does she share my same thinking and feeling on fears around the pandemic? There's just so many questions as we start to bring people back together that we have to be aware of. And, you know, we're hearing now about the great resignation, right? Where people are just saying, it's not worth it. I'm not doing sure. it. So what we have to do as leaders, it's incumbent on us to not say, well, you come back because I pay you. We have to actually make it enticing to come back and help people understand this is the reason we are coming back. We're going to get to collaborate more. There's going to be some flexibility as well, which is now a key word we're hearing as we're, we're doing employee engagement surveys is I want and found that I really like this flexibility. Can you give me at least somewhat of this? So there really are some ways that we create connection that are really important, but it comes down to, you know, being understanding of the anxieties that the people are bringing, being a little bit more flexible than we've ever been, and also giving people a voice. You know, this is, this is something that's, that's very important in this process of creating a connection, whether it's going around and, and, and making sure everybody is being involved. It also makes sure that people understand our, our bigger picture, our mission, why we're doing what we do. People really do want to be validated. And so giving them that opportunity. So there's so much that goes around connection, but it really is one of the, the key drivers that managers should be looking at right now, especially as we start kind of doing work in a different way as we hopefully start coming out of the pandemic. Right. And you wrote a chapter about gratitude and how it can reduce anxiety levels. I think that's something that could probably help build social bonds too. But how does the gratitude idea of 
you know, being more grateful, being grateful for other people. How does that reduce anxiety levels? Well, one of the things we find is that there is an incredibly high level of anxiety among high performers. In fact, high performers Mm. are almost twice as likely to burn out as sort of your regular, regular Joes. And, And why? Well, they put a tremendous amount of pressure on themselves, but there's also something we find a lot. It's called imposter syndrome, where my internal validation doesn't match up with what I'm feeling or I'm hearing externally. And so you got to keep reinforcing for me because I just don't believe it. You know, one of the, the first person to return to Broadway is actually Bruce Springsteen. I don't know if you've read his, his beautiful autobiography called Born to Run. And he talks about his lifelong anxiety attacks, uh, depression. I mean, this, this is a guy who's incredibly talented. Yeah. Uh, he's 71 years old now and he says, I will perform until I'm out there with a walker. He says, the only place that I feel like I'm myself is on stage. Why? Because he says, I'm getting instant recognition, instant gratification and gratitude from the people around me. He says, the minute I walk up stage, I start questioning myself. Well, that's, that's a shame. But that's what we find with high performers is many times they need to be reinforced over and over again. You can't say, no, 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 we gave Susie uh, Employee of the Year last year. Oh, she's great. Yeah, okay, well, it's it's July. What have you done for her since then? Because I need this over and over again. This is not weakness. It helps people understand if they're on the right path, are they doing what they need to do to help move your organization forward? Adrian, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Your book is such a good one. I appreciate you writing it along with Chester Elton. What do you want to say in in closing just about anxiety in general for individuals or even leaders and helping people cope with it? No, thanks, Brian. No, thanks. It's been a great interview and it's been so fun getting to know you better. One of the, probably the last thing I would say is, you know, with anxiety, uh, one of the most detrimental parts of it is that it makes people feel alone, that I'm the only one suffering. And the point is you are not. So whether you are suffering or it's somebody that is in your, in your family, in your, in your workplace, let them know that they are not alone. You may not know exactly what they're going through, but you've probably been in a dark place yourself. So get in touch with that. And it's not a competition. It's not saying, well, I've, no, it's saying, I understand. Just talk. Let me, let me hear. And I'm there for you. Be supportive. Don't be judgmental, but help them know they are not alone and you'll make a big difference in somebody's life. What's the best way that listeners can support you or connect with you? Anything that you want to point them to? Our new book, Anxiety at Work, came out from HarperCollins in May. So I encourage you to pick up a copy. Uh, you can find us at gosticandelton.com or, or Google Adrian Gostick. And we'd love to, to connect with any of your listeners that need some help or, or need some uh, solutions regarding building resilience in their workplaces. And, and thanks again, Brandon, for having me on the show. Adrian, it's been a pleasure. Thanks.